Preparing to delve in three, two, one. All right, welcome back to Delve, everybody. And on this episode, we are continuing our conversation about the hero's journey with stage two, initiation. Don't you want to be initiated, Alex? Start the rituals. Okay, well, no, I don't think we had to start the ritual. <laughs> Kalima. No, we're not going to do that. Kalima. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We haven't even talked about Indiana Jones in all of this. That's, su- that's surprising. Um, but, uh, all right, so uh, initiation. There's a few different phases in initiation. Uh, the first one is probably one that you're very familiar with, which is called the Road of Trials, or as I like to think of it, Comprising the major weight of your journey, you need to do a challenge montage. Basically, basically, this is Rocky uh, d- do- doing the getting strong now part. This is Mulan, let's get down to business. Let's get down, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, to defeat the Huns. Let's this, get down to business. business to defeat. To defeat. Okay. Oh, we're going to get copyright. <laughs> this isn't YouTube, we're fine. Oh, wait, that's yeah, we're fine. YouTube. Okay. This this is Luke on Dagobah with Yoda, um, learning how to be a Jedi. Learning how to carry a toad through a marsh. Learning how to carry a toad through the marsh. Yes, he he's he's Kermit, but in space. You you've learned that much. Stop it now. Stop it now. Sorry, I'm um, thinking of the seagulls. <laughs> yeah, there's. There's a lot of, of uh, different ways that you can look at this, but basically the, this, this is the part where you have to go through a bunch of trials. In a lot of ways, if we were looking back to mythology, this is the majority of the Odyssey. <laughs> this, this is basically the entire journey home uh, for Odysseus and his crew. I, I, I think that in a lot of ways, maybe you see this in games just because you, you're going to be taking your party through various conflicts uh in in the middle now that they've kind of gotten past the first big hurdle uh and and now have to go on a journey to really become the very best like no one ever was which this is, is every time goku needs to train to fight a new boss in dbz yeah this is the road of this is the road of trials for him this is the the road of trials for ash uh every time he goes to a new region to battle <laughs> To, to battle in a new championship. Um, yeah, this that's essentially this. In, in terms of Harry Potter, actually, this is the actual school year for them <laughs> every time they get to year one, two, three, and et cetera. Um, it's, it's an important thing. You go through a lot of these challenges. They inform the rest of the story. Uh, and I, I think that it's it's something that Occasionally happens organically. Sometimes it might feel a little bit forced, but in terms of, of gaming, um, it's it's really just putting in the work into yeah. your character development and learning and growing and, and meeting people and making connections and growing your level and everything like that. It's it's your grind. This is where you take side quests. <laughs> this is where you do all the side quests. Yeah. The Road of Trial is basically a whole bunch of side quests that you do to level up. Can you think of any other examples? I, I, I'm trying to think how this relates to The Little Mermaid, since apparently that's our common theme here. <laughs> um, I don't know if it can relate to The Little Mermaid. She doesn't really have many trials. It's from learning how to walk on legs. I actually, I, well, in, in that thinking, though, I can't believe we're trying to apply this to The Little Mermaid. Uh, but <laughs> Ariel, Ariel kind of does have to go through a, a, a number of trials learning how to be human. Oh, that's true. That's true. That would be her her trial. Yeah, her trials is in a new world, learning how to to live in that world with a new fantastic kind of view. A, a part of that world, yeah. So that does happen. It's not necessarily in every single story, but I would definitely say that in things like Star Wars: Lord of the Rings, you definitely see that. Um, the the whole Two Towers saga is basically just a list of different trials that they're going through. <laughs> Uh, as just armies start to descend upon them. Next part, the meeting with the goddess. Uh, important to note, not necessarily female, might be a god, might be a non-human-like figure at <laughs> in general. Uh, you experience a transformative and transcendent love 
but it's not like a rom-com or anything. There's, <laughs> there's, there's something to be said about, usually when you are at a point in your quest, sometimes when things are looking their bleakest, uh, something kind of almost supernatural comes to you and creates a transformative experience in you that allows you to continue on. All the supernatural, everything's supernatural, can't just be... I think that that's kind of a common theme, though. A lot of uh, heroes' journeys, as we think about them, have several different kinds of supernatural characters that, you know, come along and... Uh... That might be a good uh, realization because it's all focused on the myths as well, and those tended to have gods or supernatural creatures and figures in them a lot. I'm trying to... to remember exactly like if i were to take this back to the odyssey i think that there was actually a a goddess in that particular case that odysseus was familiar with who was trying to push him forward even though poseidon was really angry with him was um, it athena she usually does that it wouldn't surprise me it would not surprise me that She's sounds the one who pushed kratos right. forward mm. off the cliff yeah sorry no he jumped <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, that might have been that might have been the case. <laughs> I can't really remember now. Um, but uh, yeah. So the the general idea is that something supernatural comes to your aid. Um, that that is not just pushing you forward in the story, but is also transforming the hero as a character. Genie, see? Yes. You would make the reference for Genie and Ursula. And Ursula, yes. Actually, that is that is very true. Ursula maybe not a great example of that. Best example. <laughs> but twist. I actually think the next part will probably be more more relevant for Ursula. But I would say Genie probably is a good example of that. In Lord of the Rings, though, that would be Galadriel, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. Galadriel comes to uh, comes to Frodo in like a vision to to tell him that he has to continue on the quest uh even after he's been through all the trials it's definitely not Gollum. Gollum's a whole different actually Gollum's going to fall into the next part of this yes my precious which is probably a good way to to segue into it so uh the next part is referred to as the temptress and i will say that again not necessarily female not necessarily even human um, but this is where you spurn temptation that threatens to force you from the chosen path because you have a duty to perform, and that's possibly through punching. But basically, <laughs> this is, I, I would say, this is where, like, a Gollum and an Ursula come along. Um, that, that you are tempted to stray from that path, and you have to shirk that. Um, Gollum says, no, but the rings is... You want the rings as a power. Rings master. <laughs> oh no! And then uh, Frodo has to be able to spurn that and and say, "No, I'm not going to be tempted by the ring. I'm not going to be tempted by the ring." Um, in uh, Star Wars, I would say that it's uh, definitely that Luke is being pulled to the dark side. It's it's that realization that um, you know <laughs> I might become Vader. And that lore of power might be something, but then he has to shirk that. He has to he has to throw that off to the side. Um, Ursula, I think, is probably an agent of that. Is it, it constantly tempting Ariel uh, to to kind of like throw off any responsibilities that she might have uh, for for something that might be appealing to her? You don't usually see a lot of heroes' journeys that eventually go. No, actually, I'm totally going to be tempted, and now I'm going to go down that road. Um, if you, uh, and actually the Odyssey is a really good example of this because as you probably remember, there nope. were the, the sirens. Oh, remember? I, I haven't, do you know, do you know the last time I've read the Odyssey? Probably about the last time I read the Odyssey. <laughs> probably never. <laughs> probably never. Okay. So probably more recently than I did, but, but, uh, but there, there's the famous thing of where, where the sirens the siren's call is leading them, and so Odysseus has to tell all the crew, 
you can't be tempted by the sirens because they're going to lead you onto the rocks. So they have to put the wax in their ears uh, yes. uh, to, to avoid that temptation so that they can steer clear of the rocks so that they don't get uh, they, they, they don't get shipwrecked and eaten by sirens and eaten by sirens. Exactly. But then there's the next one where they end up on what is it? The island of Circe where the where the nice lady that's there uh, tells them, hey, here's a whole bunch of food, and Odysseus doesn't want to eat it because he's not sure about it, but, like, his whole crew does, and they all turn into the pigs because that was, that, that was the temptation, and they fell to it, and he had to reject it, even though he was very, very hungry. If we were looking at, like, a tabletop game, have you ever experienced... Because I don't think that's necessarily seen in a lot of tabletop games where, well... I say that. You say that. People fall to temptation in tabletop all the time. Come to think of it, you're right. That is the entire class of warlock. Yeah. <laughs> and and come to think of it, uh, Rembrandt got tempted by some pretty shiny swords. Yeah, and there's there's sirens and succubi and incubi. Yep. And nymphs. Yep. Lots yep. of things that'll tempt you. Yeah. M magic weapons, cursed weapons, intelligent weapons. Mm hmm Temptation is real in D&D. &D. There's, a, there's a whole lot of things that can give you untold power, but there is a cost to them if you pick them up. And you sometimes, to... sometimes people forget about the cost to them and just use them willy-nilly like god things. Yeah, that's also my favorite thing to do in gaming. <laughs> So the next part is one I see a real correlation to with one particular piece of media, but the atonement with the father, or as I like to put it, you confront your dad and it's awkward and maybe you become the dad. <laughs> you, you probably know what I'm thinking of right now. <laughs> I've become the dad. Well, well but, but actually, it, it, it sort of is that, but... Uh, no, like it, that's improbable. That's improbable. Well, but the, the idea that you become the figure that you have now confronted. Right. Um, so, obviously, the thing I think about is indeed Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's when Luke uh, gets his hand ch ch chopped off and he's like, oh, you can't be my dad. Yeah, it's like you, you've been confronted with your dad um, and your dad... Uh, is like, you, you know, come join the dark side, and uh, eventually you actually see that Luke loses his hand just like Anakin had lost his hand, and there's there's a different correlation. Later on, this actually repeats in uh, Return of the Jedi, because it, at, that, at that very end stage, where um, Vader has, like, essentially a redemption arc, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and Luke ends up uh, making peace with all of that. Basically, let me see if I can find something that explains this a little bit better. I'll, I'll actually use uh, one of the quotes from Campbell on this. So, uh, the magic of the sacraments, the protective power of primitive amulets and charms, are mankind's assurances that the arrow, the flames, and the flood are not as brutal as they seem. One must have faith that the Father is merciful, and then a reliance on that mercy. He put it a whole lot more eloquently than I ever could. Um, but this is basically the, the confrontation with your ultimate force of the storyline. Uh, that's not necessarily your enemy or, or something that is a problem, but it's definitely something you have to overcome. I would say maybe in Harry Potter, it, it's a little bit more about Snape. Severus Snape Dumbledore. Yeah, I, I kind of figure Dumbledore not necessarily as much. I think it, it's... For for Harry, he has to come to terms with, with Snape, who's not necessarily the villain of the piece, but is definitely a, a, a figurehead that has to be overcome. I'd be interested to know if people have a different interpretation of that when it comes to, to Harry Potter. But in, in a lot of ways, there is definitely a theme in a lot of heroes' journeys that in many, usually your actual father or actual mother in the story Maybe for them to accept that you are who you are, or for you to come to terms to accept that they are who they are before the story moves forward. And and maybe sometimes they're, you know, a really powerful force user that can, like, slay entire hallways worth of rebel soldiers. Yeah, you never know. like Vader. Apotheosis. 
So after becoming, after confronting and becoming the father within, I was I thought you were gonna say after becoming the father. <laughs> well, well, it actually it it is after confronting and becoming the father within, you can then rise to the status of godhood, or I'm gonna say god adjacent. <laughs> you can be god adjacent. One of these days, we're gonna have to break down why all these things all have to do with so much of familial stuff. But yeah, not, not today. Freud would probably have something to say about that. Freud would have a lot to say about <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, he sure would. Um, but it, it actually, if you think about it, especially in a lot of YA fiction, if we were to look at, uh, you know, we've been talking about Harry Potter, or if we were talking about like uh, Hunger Games, Divergent, anything like that, there are definitely some very, very important strong themes when it comes to the lineage of the the parents to the children um and and generation to generation i actually kind of even remember it in farscape because it, john's dad is like a central character at the very beginning of the of the show right i guess kind of i don't think john becomes his father i think it's more following in, in his dad's footsteps as an astronaut maybe because there's a whole thing is like you know, between him and his dad, where he's like, you've become your own hero, you know? Well, they, they obviously had a much healthier relationship than most heroes in most of the well, history. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, actually, for Lord of the Rings, since that's usually used for the epic journeys anyway, um, I would say that it has a little bit to do with how Bilbo ended up uh, going on his journey and then how Frodo ends up going on his journey, because they're very, very different. Bilbo, in a lot of ways, falls to temptations along the way and ends up wanting to keep the ring uh and then frodo eventually makes the decision to to go on the journey to eventually eliminate the ring i i would say though since we're talking about little mermaid a lot in these episodes i think that there's a little bit going on with with like ariel and king triton that king triton doesn't really want ariel to go off on her own and and go to the surface world and she kind of has to shirk her responsibility as a princess and then that has to be rectified as from from like the father to the child. So there's a little bit of that. But I do notice that like in the whole process that we're talking about, there is a a strong focus on that parents to children and then the children eventually becoming the parents and <laughs> and rising up above where the parents kind of were to begin with as a generational idea. There's there's definitely this sense in the apotheosis part of initiation where you essentially become the father figure. You become the Pope. You become the Pope, and then you start a crusade. No, you become the Pope, and then you rise to what... I, I'm going to say God to Jason, because not necessarily, but you have, you have taken on the kind of power that you thought was reserved for those very important figures that have led you to this point. You gain the mantle of Thor. I guess in terms of Thor, I guess that's he has to come to the realization that Odin had issues in the past <laughs> that he had to live down, and now he has to be better than Odin after Odin is gone and be a better version of a god than than Odin was now that he understands that that Odin and Hela did some pretty bad stuff once upon a time. Um, and then Loki's there, and Loki didn't learn any of the lessons. And then we get to uh, the ultimate boon. So, uh, basically, congratulations, you've now achieved godhood. Hooray! You, yeah, Play that sound effect where the kids are cheering. Yeah, you uh, you access the gifts of gods and can punch all the bears. Congratulations. Are you glad that you are now able to punch all the bears? Oh, I just throw the bears into orbit. That also works. Um, this is... A, there. <laughs> the hero's access to the gifts of the gods is, is a car. And you can use it to punch all the bears <laughs> off a road. That's how this works. Uh, how, how does the ultimate boom work? Well, you know, I think that this kind of is the place that uh, a Luke Skywalker would be at the beginning of the... the um, Return of the Jedi in a lot of ways. You know, he's he, he's gotten very powerful. He's gone through all the training. Uh, you, you are prepped for the, the final conflict. Uh, Aragorn's gotten his, you know, uh, 
posse of the dead army folks uh, so that he can wipe out a whole bunch of orcs. Uh, this, this is that point in the story. Harry's graduated from school and he's, and he's learned everything that Hogwarts can teach him. Uh, Katniss has started her revolution. She's learned, you know, uh, everything that she can about the Hunger Games, and now she just wants to take on actual presence. No, um, it's that part. It your your hero is now essentially fully formed, and at the height of their power. Kind of an important step, I would say, uh, especially leading into the return. Do you uh, see any of this relating to like a, a tabletop game? In a Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, or... I mean, sometimes players get really powerful, like objects, and they become really powerful, and then maybe you've got to topple them. Like they're right. at the top of their game, they've like saved the town, they're hailed as like heroes. Then a new challenger awaits. Right. This is in many ways where uh, Ash Ketchum catches like the Mewtwo. And uh, there's not a lot of other places for Ash to go, but up, until there's another thing that... But but he is now fully prepared for what is going to await him. Um, but you made an interesting uh, observation there, which is that this does feel like the part where some hero's journeys might turn into the villain's journey. Oh, well, I wasn't even trying to make that point, but sometimes it's like... That's also where some people end their journey. Yeah, yeah. There is no real resolution, uh, except that, you know, congratulations, you have won. <laughs> congratulations, you're the new god. You're the new god. Hope you like Hope you like that, the old gods. Brr, you're the new god. Um, yeah, I, I can definitely see, and this is not something that's really talked about in, in the hero's journey, because it is very much about that monomyth and the structure they're in. But this does feel like the kind of thing where you you could essentially see a character become th that this is almost the start of a villain arc after you've you've gotten to this point. Um uh so I will just I'll read another excerpt from Campbell about this. Might help to kind of like put a little capper on this episode, but uh, the gods and goddesses then are to be understood as the embodiments and custodians of the elixir of impoverishable being. What the hero seeks is their grace, the power of their sustaining substance. Its guardians dare release it only to the duly proven. But the gods may be over-severe, over-cautious, in which case the hero must trick them of their treasure." This is essentially the ultimate boon. This is the hero rising to that level of godhood and getting all the things. In a lot of ways, you're right. That is probably where many heroes' journeys will end. But That's not where ours. Our journey, <laughs> That's where our journey ends, right? That's About where like our journey... a year and a half, two years ago? Yeah, exactly. At uh, our peak. Before we became the villain? <laughs> well. <laughs> well. Before we became the villain. That's fine. <laughs> I don't know if I'd consider us villains. Oh, well, depends. We're villains guys. in our own story. If we're the villains of our own story, <laughs> we played ourselves. Um, that is where some heroes' journeys might actually end. However, however, that's not necessarily where our journey ends. I would say that um, going back to the Odyssey... You go back to that Odyssey a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I I go back to the Odyssey only because I imagine since Campbell was a studier of mythology and this that's really one of the most famous mythological stories, I imagine he was drawing from it quite a bit. But I would say that when we get to the ultimate boon, this is actually where the trials are all over and Odysseus is coming home uh, after being essentially told that he doesn't have to. Um, there, there's a part where Odysseus has the possibility of living a perfectly nice, happy life away from home, having succeeded in all of his trials and everything like that. Um, and that is where the story could have ended for him, but he doesn't, he, because what he engages in is the third phase of the hero's journey, which we're going to be talking about on the next episode, which is... The return. Of the and episode? The return. 
is the phase three. The return of what, though? Oh, we're going to tell you. The return Stay tuned. Of... As Stay we t- return. <laughs> we will be back with part three. Dun, the return. Dun, dun. And so that completes phase two initiation of the hero's journey. Uh, one editorial note that I will make uh, concerning the Odyssey is uh, believe Alex actually, even though he doesn't seem to remember anything about the story, I believe was indeed right. Uh, Athena would have been the goddess that intervened on behalf of, well, the gods like Zeus uh, to keep Poseidon in line to try and help Odysseus out. In terms of what I was thinking about with uh, Odysseus having a nice, happy life that he could be in, I may have possibly been thinking about once he got to Phoenicia and he had a somewhat semblance of life, but he was always looking to get back to Ithaca. I uh, I think I've forgotten more about some of these stories than I've remembered. But anyway, we will return with, well, The Return, which is part three, on the next episode. Until then, you can always find everything that we've done on Delve for the entire time we've been up and operational over at DelveCast.com. Please make sure to check on our Patreon banner. There's a lot of additional exclusive content for our patrons, even if you are just donating at like a dollar. And that is content that will continue on even after we have rebranded, because I still want to make sure that all that content is still viable. Obviously, why not utilize it? And if you do not know, you can also find us on the magical thing called the internet on Twitter. I am at Citanium, Alex is at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. Also, thank you very much to our shiny level patrons, Bonnie Ainsworth and Drunk Paul over on Discord. Thank you for getting us to a level one Discord server. Okay. We will return on next week's episode with the third and final part of the hero's journey. Thank you for joining us again on this episode. And be ready to join us for that one final installment as we come full circle in our hero's journey. <laughs>